بي براد اوف بي ان سبس هير ان افريك يور انسيسترز ذا هاف ناثينغ تو دو وذ ماي كانتريز يو ان يور بي باول هاف اولويز بين بلاو ذي ساهيل مي براتا مي انسيسترز هاف باسد داون تو اوس ار هيستوريز اند ميكريتوري باترنز سو ويت نو اور انسيسترز كيم فروم تو نوت وي ار ان نوت انسينت ويست افريكانز سو was haplogroup M2 the paternal lineage of majority of West and Central Africans today restricted solely to West and Central Africa? We shall let the evidence talk. To start off, we will be reading over the paper, The Peopling of the Last Green Sahara, revealed by high coverage resequencing of Trans-Saharan patrilineages, lineages. And we'll be starting off to the far right. We're going to be reading a few pages to get a brief understanding of what we will be going into today. Starting off in the highlighted, it reads, On the contrary, Sub-Saharan Africa is characterized by a completely different genetic landscape, with lineages within EM2 and haplogroup B comprising most of the Y chromosomes in most regions of Sub-Saharan Africa. The observed haplogroup distribution has been linked to the recent demic diffusion of Bantu agriculturalists, which brought EM2 subclades from Central Africa to the east and to the south. On the contrary, the sub-Saharan distribution of BM150 seems to have more ancient origins since its internal lineages are present in both Bantu farmers and non-Bantu hunter-gatherers and correlates long before the Bantu expansion. So, Haplogroup EM2 would be more recent in two Sub-Saharan Africa by way of the Bantu expansion and Haplogroup BM150 would be more ancient as it said. So continuing, in spite of their genetic differentiation, however, Northern and Sub-Saharan Africa share at least four patrol lineages at different frequencies, namely A3M13, EM2, EM78 and RV88. So again, Northern and Sub-Saharan Africa carries these four patrol lineages. A3M13, EM2, EM78, and RV88. Continuing over to the left of my page, it reads, in this context, rare lineages with a relic geographic distribution can be highly informative regarding human migrations across the Sahara, thus considering their frequency distribution. The four Trans-Saharan lineages, AM13, EM2, EM78, and RV88 could represent the remains of the Sahara MSY genetic landscape before the desertification, contrary to the usual interpretation involving recent gene flow events such as Trans-Saharan Arab slave trade. So keep that in mind as we're reading over this paper. Continuing on, we'll be focusing more on EM2 solely since that's the topic of discussion today. So, it reads, the typology of EM2 is characterized by main multifurcation dating back to the beginning of the last Green Sahara, which is dated around 2.53 thousand years ago and including all the deep sequence samples itself one, branch 70, consistent with the tree reported in phase three of the 1000 genomes project. However, we found 11 subclades, branches 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 79, 81, 82, 95, 98, and 99, which share no markers with the 263 EM2 chromosomes analyzed by Paulsnick and colleagues. It is worth noting that branches 72 and 81 are two deeper sister lineages within the EM2 multifurcation and both of them include chromosomes from Northern Africa. So to visualize what we just read about EM2 branches 72 and 81 having chromosome segments within Northern Africa we're going to look at a table provided in this study of EM2 and its branches with the associated regions outlined. Meaning its chromosomes are based in North Africa and even if we go to branch 81 as it mentioned 
we will see that it's color coded to match Northwestern Africa. Now this is important because it's showing that two of the deepest branches within EM2 actually has Northern African origins. And even if you look at branch 70 right above these, it's color coded to match the Central Sahel, which is basically a part of Northern Africa as well. Continuing on, now we're going to start to get a little deeper into the distribution of EM2. It reads, It is known that the geographic distribution of EM2 in Sub-Saharan Africa has been heavily influenced by the recent 3,000 year ago Bantu expansion, and this is mirrored by the high frequencies of several EM2 subclades among the Bantu people, in particular EU290 as well as EU-174. However, we found clues as to the role of the last Green Sahara, considering the phylogeography of EM2 subclades in Northern Africa. The coalesced age of the lineages harboring Northern and Sub-Saharan chromosomes predates the onset of the ridge conditions, falling between 11.3 thousand years ago and 4.49 thousand years ago during the last Green Sahara. After this time frame, we observe clays restricted to the north or to the south of the Sahara. So based off the reports from this paper, it is believed that prior to the Green Sahara and the Aridge conditions, you had clays of EM2 both within Northern and Sub-Saharan Africa. But after these conditions, or the ridge conditions of the Green Sahara, you had clays of EM2 restricted solely to North Africa and clays restricted solely to Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, this is very, very interesting and true indeed because I actually wrote a paper for my chemistry class about the fragmentation events within the Green Sahara that isolated the lions within Africa. Because of the Green Sahara and the fragmentation events, you had lions that were basically restricted to sub-Saharan Africa and you had lions that became restricted to Northern Africa and the Near East. And those lions that were restricted to Northern Africa and the Near East were known as your Asiatic lions and your lions restricted below the sub-Saharan African regions were known as your sub-Saharan African lions. And I bring that up because we see the same thing going on with the movements of peoples. Peoples with these haplogroups or with related haplogroups being restricted to different locations because of the Green Sahara event. But let's get back to the paper. In this context, although the large majority of the geographical restricted lineages come from Sub-Saharan African regions, we also found two Northern African specific clades, namely EV501, EV4990. EV501 has only been found in Egypt. It's one of the sister clays within the EM4727 multifurcation and coalesce at 3.88 thousand years ago. So remember this clay because we're going to go into EM2 in Egypt later. It continues on. Haplogroup EV4990 is a Moroccan clay dated to 4.49 thousand years ago. Interestingly, it is the terminal branch of a nested typology which divides Western Africa from Morocco. We found a relevant portion, 22% of African American subjects belonging to the EM2 typology. Now that's very, very deep and interesting because it's saying that specifically 22% of the African Americans that have EM2 have this specific Moroccan EM2 clay, all right? So if you take that into account, that's a lot of African Americans who descend from quote unquote slaves that came from Morocco who harbor the specific EV4990 clay, all right? Continue. These groups have been heavily influenced by the Atlantic slave trade, which took place between the 15th and 16th centuries and of which the source populations were mainly sub-Saharan people, consistent with the autosomal data. 
these subjects have been found to be very similar to the source African populations in their EM2 subhaplo group composition. Moving on throughout the paper to look at more of this distribution of EM2, it reads that these findings suggest that the Nilo Saharan spread along the Sahelian belt was probably a complex event evolving different clays and different movements from the Lake Chad Basin to Eastern Africa and back. Haplogroup EM2, whose coalescence age, 7,000 years ago, falls within the last Green Sahara period, seems to have been involved in another Sahelian movement, being present at high frequencies among different Fulube groups. Interesting, the geographical distribution of this clay perfectly traces the Fulube migration from Western Africa, where this haplogroup is also common in other ethnic groups to Central Sahel, but the same haplogroup is only found among Fulubi populations. So, even have Fulani or Fulubi populations who have a specific EM2 clade, and that EM2 clade is Z15939. And another interesting thing to take part in, or to take interest in, is that it is believed that the Fulani originally spoke Afro-Asiatic languages and lost it during their migrations across the Sahel to Western Africa adopting Niger Congo. That's just something to think about when it comes to the conversation of EM2 and its Afro-Asiatic origins. Now let's get into what we really came here for. Let's get into the meat of the discussion. And of course, we will start at the hollow. Usually, the presence of Sub-Saharan African genetic component in Northern Africa is put down to the Arab slave trade from the Sub-Saharan regions toward the market locations along the Mediterranean coast. If this was the case, we should observe no significant differences in the Sub-Saharan component of the white haplogroups between the African American and Northern African populations, since both the Atlantic and the Arab slave trade are recent events which evolved the same source geographic era. However, considering the distribution of M2 sub-lineages in the American admix, Northern African, and Sub-Saharan populations, we found a significant correlation between admix and Sub-Saharan groups consistent with the genome-wide data. While Northern Africans and Sub-Saharan people were not correlated, consistent with these findings, also Northern Africans and American admix people were found not to be correlated. The same pattern was also observed when only the Western Central Sahelian groups of Sub-Saharan Africa were considered. These data suggest that the presence in Northern Africa of Sub-Saharan Patrick lineages was not due to recent contacts, but probably occurred in more ancient time so let me read that again let me read that again let me read that again these data suggest that the presence in northern africa of sub-saharan patrol lineages was not due to recent contacts but probably occurred in more ancient times possibly during the green Sahara period considering the coalescent ages of the clades our findings seems to be at odds with genome-wide studies it also seems to be at odds with people's opinions online, all right? Again, our finding seems to be at odds with genome-wide studies reporting a recent relevant sub-Saharan genetic component in modern North African populations, mainly attributed to the Arab slave trade. This apparent discrepancy between inferences based on Y chromosome and autosomal data could be the consequence of a sex bias sub Saharan contribution in the Northern African gene pool that occurred in historical times. Indeed, it is known that the Trans Saharan Arab slave trade involved twice as many servile women as men. Moreover, few male slaves left descendants, right? Moreover, few male slaves left descendants. On top of that, they used to castrate the males, so some of them left zero male descendants. Moreover, few male slaves left descendants, whereas female slaves were imported into Northern Africa as household servants and as concubines, and their offspring were born free 
thus contributing to the local gene pool. So if you want to talk about sub-Saharan African lineages in Northern Africa being recent, you want to talk about the mtDNA and not the males, not the y hypo distribution. Thus, we suggest that the Arab slave trade mainly contributed to the mtDNA and autosomal gene pool of present-day Northern Africans, whereas the paternal gene pool was mainly shaped by more ancient events. This hypothesis is in line with genome-wide data obtained from three ancient Egyptian mummies dated between 2.5 and 2,000 years ago, showing a not negligible ancient sub-Saharan component, 6 to 10%. And for example, who are they talking about here? They're talking about Ramses III and the other brother who had haplogroup EM2, all right? They had haplogroup EM2, but they had negligible sub-Saharan African components. And if you have 23andMe, and if you have EM2, you know where it tells you that Ramses III was from. Western Asia or Northern Africa, not Sub-Saharan. So here we have an EM2's chart, and it has on it American admix population, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Northern Africa. And what it's doing is giving us an outline of the distribution of the clade. So for example, M2 star. We see that it's fully blue representing Northern Africa. All right, so we can pretty much emphasize that basal M2 had its origins in Northern Africa, while its daughter clades over time eventually moved and made its way throughout the rest of Africa. If, for example, we see other EM2 clades within this composition that has North African distribution and origins, as well as Sub Saharan. All right. So, again, for example, EM4727, we see that that's primarily North African, as well as Sub Saharan African. And we see that we have African Americans or American admix populations, which represents African Americans with this applicable as well. We see EM110, that's half North African, half Sub Saharan African. EV501, that's fully North African. EV261, that's fully North African. All right. EV4990, that's fully North African. EA186, star, that's fully North African, and so on. So you have a good example of the distribution of these specific clades and their origins based off this paper. Now, after reading the peopling of the last Green Sahara, we have an understanding that EM2 within Northern Africa is not based off the Arab slave trade. It's based off ancient origins. Now, that's very, very interesting because even Arabs with EM2 believed that their haplogroup was by way of the slave trade, but it wasn't. Take a listen here. There are Arabs who belong to the EM2 haplogroup specifically. That is the haplogroup identified with the Bantu expansion of Sub-Saharan Africa. So originally when some Arabs discovered that they were from EM2, but they weren't black looking, they were confused. They thought, oh, maybe my ancestor was originally enslaved from Africa and that's where my haplogroup comes from. But some of these people started working online, uh, co combining their ancestries, mainly on familytreedna.com, and discovered that these guys shared ancestry with other people at least 2,000 years old that was in the Arabian Peninsula. So 2,000 years ago, you know, the e Apple group somehow has been in the Arabian Peninsula. So the e Apple group has been in the Arabian Peninsula for a very long time. In fact, there began to be a theory that the e Apple group arrived in the Arabian Peninsula even before the j Apple group returned, I'll talk about this later, from around Albania. But anyway, the point is, there is an ancient e Apple group among the Arabs. And these people share absolutely no genetic uh, similarities except for that haplogroup with Africans. So for example, if they go on 23andMe, it'll say 0.0% African DNA, but they'll belong to E. So this is a very ancient haplogroup among the Arabs. So interesting enough, even Arabs believe that their genetic ancestry of EM2 was by way of slavery. Now, it's even a paper that mentions 
that EM2 or Sub-Saharan African DNA has had an ancient presence in Arabia. And that paper is called The Genomic History of the Middle East. As it reads, another contrast between the Levant and Arabia is the access of African ancestry in the Arabian populations. We found that the closest source of African ancestry for most populations in our data set is Bantu speakers from Kenya in addition to contributions from nilo saharan speakers from Ethiopia. We estimate that the African admixture in the Middle East occurred within the last 2,000 years, with most populations showing signals of admixture around 500 to 1,000 years ago in agreement with the previous studies. So we can start to put a picture together here. With EM2 being in ancient Northern Africa, it's not hard to believe that it could have easily made its way over throughout the Levant and even throughout Arabia. To speak further on that, interesting enough, the supplementary material for the biomolecular insights into North African related ancestry mobility and diet in the 11th century al andalus gives us some very very important information so if we was to go into the supplementary materials we will find a chart specifically that goes into the locations of specific haplogroups now within this paper haplogroup e1b1b is highlighted so that's the one that we can see the best but if we was to zoom in a little bit, we can see that they did make reference to E1B1A. And interestingly enough, they mentioned clays of E1B1A in North Africa and the Middle East. So they gave us two EM2 Palestinian markers. And that one is E1B1A1A1A1 also known as EM4706. The other Palestinian clay that they gave us is E1B1A1A1A. This is known as EM817. And finally, the third EM2 clay they gave us is, is focused in Egypt, and that is E1B1A. 1A, 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 1. That's also known as EZ6002 or EZ15932. Now I find that strikingly interesting because there's papers that actually go into Sub-Saharan African DNA or quote unquote EM2 being within Palestine and the Levant between 1,600 and 3,400 years ago. And I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with this paper. The History of African Gene Flow into Southern Europeans, Levantines, and Jews. Again, it reads, A striking finding from our study is the consistent detection of 3-5% Sub-Saharan African ancestry in all eight diverse Jewish groups we studied. Ashkenazis, Sephardis, and Mizrahis. We estimate that the average date of the mixture of 72 generations is older than that in southern Europeans or other Levantines. The point estimates over all eight populations are between 1,000 and 3,400 years ago, but with largely overlapping confidence intervals. It is intriguing that the Mizrahi, Iranian, and Iraqi Jews who are thought to descend at least in part from Jews who were exiled to Babylon about 2,600 years ago share a signal of African admixture. A parsonomious explanation for these observations is that they reflect a history in which many of the Jewish groups descend from a common ancestral population which was itself admixed with Africans prior to the beginning of the Jewish diaspora that occurred in the 8th and 6th centuries BC. So again, based off the peopling of the Green Sahara paper, it would make sense to why we see M2 or Sub-Saharan African DNA within these Jewish groups as well as other Levantine groups. 
because EM2 would have been in the north and virtually North Africa is connected to the Middle East. That's why it's not surprising to me when I find 11% of Palestinians having West African ancestry, 15% of Bedouins having West African ancestry, and of course, the Jewish groups having percentages of West African ancestry. So here we have a collage of various people such as Arabs, Palestinians, Bedouins, Druze, and even Jews. They all may have different facial features and skin colors, but the one thing they have in common is that EM2, is that West African ancestry. Now, I'm not saying that the total populations of these people have EM2 or West African ancestry, but I am saying according to the data, you have people within these populations, a good percentage of people actually, within these populations that have that EM2 ancient ancestry. And it's not based off recent times, it's based off ancient distribution. Ancient distribution of EM2 being in the north. And again, to further add more reasoning behind those Palestinian EM2s, we shall go to the genome-wide diversity in the Levant reveals recent structuring by culture. It reads, a recent study by Marjani et al., the study we just reviewed, estimated the Jewish admixture with African genes ended much earlier, 75 generations ago, than other Levantines, Muslims, 32 generations ago. However, it is not known if this different admixture history is the result of out migrations from the region and the discontinued gene flow from the neighboring populations, or if it is a result of cultural isolation in a predominantly Christian and latter Muslim environment. Will today's Christians from the Levant also show older dates for a cessation of African admixture than Levantines, reflecting cultural genetic isolation from their surrounding neighbors? Let's see. Promo Painters Cone Ancestry Matrix shows the haplotype chunk donated from the Ware populations to the Levantines and shows that Jordanians, Palestinians, and Syrians receive more chunks from Sub-Saharan Africans and from Middle Easterners compared to other Levantines. Now, the only way for Jordanians, Palestinians, and even Syrians to receive quote-unquote Sub-Saharan African chunks or DNA is if these sub-Saharan Africans, quote unquote, was in the area. We found that Christians have the oldest admixture dates. So not only do the Jews from Palestine have sub-Saharan African admixture, the Christians do. And there's date to around 2,370 years ago to 2,325 years ago, with bounds coinciding with the decline of Phoenicia and the control of the region by the Hellenistic rulers. The time since the observed Druze admixture closely precedes the development of the Jews' faith and their divergence from other Muslims. The Muslims appear to have maintained contact with populations carrying sub-Saharan genes until 675 to 625 years ago, which overlaps the rise of the Ottoman Empire and formation of a semi autogenous site in Lebanon. So even up to 625 years ago, you had Muslims coming into contact with populations in the Middle East who carried sub-Saharan African genes. This is based off ancient distribution. Historical events coinciding with the observed admixture dates are some of the examples of population processes and the demographic events that were occurring during this period in the Levant. These historical events, in addition to cultural adaptations and transitions, may have contributed to the differences among the religious groups throughout facilitating or restricting contact with other Middle Easterners carrying the Sub-Saharan genes. All right, and again, the only way for Middle Easterners to carry Sub-Saharan African genes is for Sub-Saharan Africans to be in the Middle East. All right, so the two papers I just brought out 
African gene flow in Southern European Levantinic Jews, as well as genome-wide diversity in a Levant, both brings credence to the EM2 Palestine clades. Now, what about the Egyptian? What about the Egyptian clade mentioned in the peopling of the last Green Sahara and also mentioned in the supplementary material of the mobility paper? To get some more information on EM2 in Egypt, let's go to the paper, History and the Interpretation of the Pattern of P49AF Tac1 RFLPY chromosome variation in Egypt, a consideration of multiple lines of evidence. Now this paper is kind of old and it uses a old haplogroup format, but I will be sure to break it down to the best of my ability. Starting at the highlighted, it reads haplotype 4 or E1B1A on the M2 PN1 subclade is notably found in West Central and Sub Equatorial Africa in speakers of Niger Congo languages and also at noteworthy frequencies in at least one group of Nilo Saharan speakers, such as Nubians, some Afro Asiatic speakers, and Upper Egyptians who have linguistically shifted branches within Afro Asiatic. Ancient Egyptian slash Coptic to Semitic. So it's worth noting that not only do we have EM2 speakers who speak quote unquote Niger Congo, but we also have some that speak Nilo Saharan, also Afro Asiatic and Semitic. And if we go over here to the chart and we look up under haplogroup 4, or we see that the haplogroup is in Egypt at 13.9% as a whole, as well as in Lebanon at 3%. So just like the papers told us about there being a EM2 specific to Egypt, we see that EM2 is at a frequency of around 13.9% in Egypt as a whole. Going over to the next chart, we can see that within Lower Egypt, it's only at around 1.2%, but in Upper Egypt, it actually takes up around 27.3%, and even down in Nubia, around 39.1%. And finally, 23andMe. You and Ramses III share an ancient paternal line ancestor, probably live in North Africa or Western Asia. And with the information we have went over, that's pretty much true, all right? We read over the, the peopling of the last Green Sahara, showing that M2 ancestral clades had its origins in Northwest and Northeast Africa, and even going into another paper and showing that you had Palestinian specific EM2 clades. And even going and showing the ancient EM2 distribution throughout the Middle East in places like Palestine as well as Arabia. I hope you all enjoyed this content, the information, and of course stay tuned as we continue to bring our top level information on this channel. Shalom and thank you for tuning in.